Welcome to Shadow of Truth, and today is Monday, April the 10th, 2017, and your hosts are Dave Kranzler from InvestmentResearchDynamics.com and Rory Hall from TheDailyCoin.org. What's going on, Dave? Well, just another Monday. Just Stock another Monday. Stock market's up, precious metals down. Looks like looks like the manipulators are are been, been busy at work since early this morning. <laughs> Cartel is in the house. I, I always said that you know, if a if a small nuclear bomb were detonated in Times Square, that the Dow would probably spike up five hundred points. And <laughs> you know, I think what's happened between between Friday and this morning is probably proof that I'm right. There you go. <laughs> That's it. Oh, well, let's jump in and make it happen then. We'll be fighting with sticks and stones like Einstein predicted. That's, I believe that. <laughs> These guys, yeah. it's it's incredible. I was listening to uh, uh, Rogue Money with uh, London Paul just, to, just before we got on the call. And uh, London Paul made a really good point about why the airstrip didn't suffer any damage. And of course, what they said was, well, we didn't want to damage. We didn't want to do this. We want to do that. Well, they left out the part about the uh, S-400, the Russian S-400 uh, air defense system being in play and taking control of these 25-plus-year-old cruise missiles and putting them where they wanted them, where they wouldn't cause any damage. And unfortunately, some some civilians did lose their lives, but I thought I found that to be very interesting, and it's very credible because the S four hundred is that system is in Syria. It's also in Iran, and I believe. So wait, it, you're you're saying this guy's saying that. Uh... The, the U.S. launched the missiles and then Russia's air defense system took control of them and, and directed them to an area where they wouldn't cause damage. Correct. Other than to the people who died. Correct. Where yeah. were they supposed to hit? They were supposed to destroy the, this uh, airfield, but they didn't. they didn't. They didn't hit any of the runways. None of the runways. Are, the runways are 100% intact. And huh. Trump, Trump came out and said, "Well, we didn't want to do that because they knew that we knew that they could quickly repair them, and that wouldn't be that big a deal." Well, it's not true. Well, where, yeah, well, where was the bomb supposed to hit then? <laughs> right. <laughs> what's the point of attacking an airfield if you don't take out the the uh, long, the uh, landing strips, take off? <laughs> so. And I, th I think that what's going what we're going to see happen is an acceleration of this uh, of gold coming into play with Russia and China. With the, I think they're going to make a bigger play. I think it's going to accelerate everything, all of their plans, which I wrote about the other day. That that this would just accelerate everything to such a degree that it's going to blow everybody's mind i think i mean i hope that i'm wrong because it's gonna it'll make things ugly quick a lot quicker but well yeah that's a good question in terms of uh you know what what gold's gonna do i think you gotta you know i think you gotta look at it over a very short term period versus say by the end of the summer you know i think i i don't disagree with your assessment that by the end of the summer it's going to be a heck of a lot higher than it is right now but the way the if you look at the latest commitment of trader report the bullion banks are just they're just unloading an incredible amount of paper into the comex system in order to offset any of the of the market's impetus to take the price higher which is what we saw on Friday. Yeah, Thursday night when those missiles were launched, gold and silver both shot for the moon. Right. And it, you know, it makes sense from their standpoint that they, you know, they're not going to let gold 
stay up 20 bucks or however much it was because then all of a sudden people would be like well why do we you know they would look more closely and question more closely you know exactly what and why those missiles were launched so um and it's interesting because most of the sell-off in gold didn't occur until till after london closed and then the u.s comex is is the only open gold market in the world. In fact, the U.S. markets and the North American markets are the only markets in the world that are open at that point. And that's usually when they, when they really, if they're going to, if they need to feel, if they feel like they need to push down the price of gold and silver, they wait until Friday afternoon to do it. And that's what we saw Friday. Right. As soon as the COMEX, it looks like as soon as the COMEX closed down, down, everything went gold and silver both just headed for the basement right and it actually it peaked before the comex closed and started heading heading lower it's really after london closes because there's to the extent that there's really any physical gold that changes hands in london um you know london still has a physical component to its market i mean the comex doesn't have anything it's just paper yeah it's a joke is what it is right why in the world would you have one of your have your main trading partner in your office and then have him wait while you go launch missiles at one of your trading partner's allies? Excuse, excuse me, uh, President uh, Xi Jinping, uh, I need to go launch some missiles. Can you hold on for just a second? Oh, and by the way, they're going to be launched at one of your uh, allies that you've just agreed to go in and help rebuild the from the damage that we just caused. We're going to go cause some more damage, so give me just a second. I mean, and that's what happened. I mean, here this man is in uh, Trump's office, and he's launching missiles at, at one of his allies. It's like, what kind of sick joke is that? I think that uh, gold and silver are going to to uh, play out in a way that's going to make uh, everybody's head spin. Because as I was reporting on the other day, you know the IMF and their whole decaching scheme. I think that that's going to play a part in uh, gold and silver's uh, run up through the through the end of this year and into probably 2018 as well. And as the fallout from what's just happened with this missile attack on Syria, I think that that, like I said a minute ago, that's going to compress the plans that Russia and China already had, already have in motion to begin working outside of the IMF, SWIFT system, World Bank, BIS, to move away from that. I think that all of that is going to be accelerated. And as I found out and reported about the other day as well, China already has a gold currency, not a gold-backed currency, but an actual gold currency that they traded there was fourteen and a half million dollars equivalent. It was well over a hundred million renminbi worth of gold currency that traded on an on an app called WeChat uh, during the Chinese Lunar New Year. In that one week period, fourteen and a half million dollars of gold currency swapped hands. Which it was just like when I read that, it was like, oh my god. So they've already got gold in play. Huh. Where where did you read about that? It was reported uh, by a gentleman named who has a YouTube channel called uh, Silver Report. But that's what he was reporting back on April the 2nd, April 1st or April 2nd, one of the two, because I wrote this article. Uh, the real reason the federal government had been keen to blame Russia for everything is gold. And I, I published that on April the 2nd. Huh, that's interesting. Yeah, I thought so too. 
what we're going to see is a is a quickening to move everything into place because they're sick of it. I mean, nobody trusts us. They, our trust, the trust in the United States on a, on the global stage was already in question, and now this situation with Syria, I don't think that anybody trusts us for anything at this point at all. I mean, why would you? Like I said, you got Xi Jinping sitting in your office and you tell him to hold on for a second while you go bomb one of his allies. I mean, what a slap in the face. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how, uh, to, to see the, you know, how, how Russia and China respond to this. Well, Russia and Iran have already come out and said, that's it. You, you, you just crossed our red line and anything from, from here on is game on, period. And Russia already told uh, the United States several months ago that you can forget not having bombs dropped on your on your soil, as they they will. We're we're going to. I mean, that's what Putin. Well, said. Here, you know, here's the thing: we knew this was going to happen. I mean, all you had to do was look at the pieces that were being put in place. I mean, right. Trump's Secretary of State, this guy Tillerson, he's the ex CEO. He's the CEO of Exxon. And he's he's trying to tell us that he's completely disconnected himself from Exxon and and uh, you know what what isn't being reported at all is the fact that Exxon wants to put a natural gas pipeline from Qatar through Syria through Turkey and then into Southern Europe. Yep, and that's, that's, what, it's that's all about. what this whole thing in Syria is all about. It's not right. trying to contain the U.S. created ISIS or fighting terrorism it's not it's not it's not as trump said it's not vital he trump said it's vital to u.s security interests that we bomb the piss out of syria well how is that at all you know that how do you connect those dots right you know i mean to my knowledge there haven't even been any syrians involved in in terrorist in in alleged terrorist acts against the united states it just it just blows my mind. And then t when Tillerson said that that the administration was OK with Assad remaining in power, I knew right then they were planning something, you know, and he didn't disconnect himself from Exxon. He's he's the CEO of Exxon. I don't I don't care if he's, you know, now made secretary of state. I mean, to me, as soon as that as soon as I saw what who was made secretary of state, I'm like, oh, no, Syria is going to become a real problem. Because I also know that that Russia and China aren't going to stand for it, right? And they're not. That's why. And and the, here's the thing. Here's here's the way that I look at it. They don't. Neither country has to fire a shot. All they have to do is turn on their uh, alternative to the SWIFT system. Introduce just a small amount of gold into the system, and that's it. Game over. Then they don't, and like I said, no shots have to be fired. They can, it can just be, it can be 100% economic. And if we go to war, if the United States is still arrogant enough, and, and they most certainly are, these criminals in Washington, D.C. are crazy enough to actually believe that they can win a war with Russia and China, even though, as we reported right here, uh, with uh, Dr. Paul Craig Roberts, he brought to the table that Russia and the, that the Pentagon had conducted 16 different war games with Russia and the United States lost 100% of the 16 war games. Not 50%, not 70%, 100% loss across all spectrums in every way that you can imagine 16 different ways 16 different ways united states lost in war games no one, no one's going to win in a in a war game in a in, no one's going to win if if russia and the united states and china go to war no it'll be it'll it'll fulfill einstein's prediction that world war four will be fought with sticks and stones absolutely absolutely and a massive depopulation of this planet. 
Well, that's a pretty happy Monday right there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just a little, just a little reality check. So what do you see in, uh, what's the COT report telling you, Dave, other than they're, they're pushing well, a lot I mean, of it's... paper. To, to I think, try to keep I think it our down. audience is aware of what's what's going on there. I mean, the, the banks are are I, th I think in silver the outright short position is the largest that it's ever been. So you're talking about a short position that is higher than it was when silver hit almost hit fifty bucks back in 2011. The net short position, I'm not sure, is at an all-time high, but it's pretty close to an all-time high. Yeah. And the open interest, the open interest is is about where it was when silver almost hit 50 bucks. And so here we are, here we are with silver at 18 dollars, and the open interest is as high as it was when silver almost hit 50. I mean, that makes no sense whatsoever. It's a lot of paper. Yeah. Yeah, I think so, it was, I think uh, Harvey Oregon reported that it was about 9,000 short of all time high on the open interest on Thursday. Something like that. Yeah. It's, I think the all time high was around 230,000. And as of Friday's trading, it, 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 it uh, was up to 221. Yeah. So, <clears throat> I mean, that's just, that's insane. And it's less than half. Well, it's insane when you when you compare the paper open interest against the amount of silver that's allegedly being held in Comex in Comex vaults. I mean, you, you, right now you're talking about an amount of silver represented by the Comex paper silver that is 25 percent greater than the and than the amount of silver that's produced annually by the entire world. <laughs> so. <laughs> Ah, uh, well, time for a rule change. <laughs> it's coming. Because, <laughs> uh, you know. And when just, all else fails, start a war. Yeah. Change the rules and then start a war. <laughs> <laughs> well, where do we go from here, Dave? Uh, I might go back to bed. I'm tired. I may do the same. Just tired of, you know, these markets are becoming fatiguing because they're so artificial. Everything about the U.S. markets is artificial. It's all one giant lie. Right. It's all that it is. I mean, we were talking about retail a minute ago and, you know, H.H. Uh, Gregg announced this morning that their bankruptcy didn't work. They couldn't find a buyer closing 220 stores within, within the next couple months. Nationwide. They're completely going out of business. Done. Over. Cooked. You know, I think that that, you know, as you brought to the table a couple weeks ago, retail sales are down 15 percent. And I think that we're going to see a lot more of these closings uh, going on, even more so than what was reported at the in the middle, I, I think, of last year, where there was this whole long list of of companies that were. Uh, going to close stores, you know, over the remainder of 2016 and into 2017. I think that that list is probably going to grow and that where it's going to, the carnage is about to start coming to the surface and it won't be, it won't be easily hidden the way that it has been in the past. So, right. But again, it's, it's, you know, the, the, the culprit is, is the, the blame for it's going to be, you know, the, will be online sales, which is not true. Not true at all. Debt. These right. companies that are going bankrupt, it's because they have too much debt on their balance sheet. It, it shows, it exemplifies how, how Wall Street and the elitists are, are gutting the system by making it easy for these companies to issue debt. Any of these companies would be able to compete with the online retail model if they didn't have debt, but they can't compete price-wise because they have to generate enough cash flow to cover their debt. And that's why Walmart can compete with Amazon because it, it doesn't have the leverage like some of these, these companies that are hitting the wall. I mean, Macy's has an incredible amount of debt on its balance sheet and they can't take their prices down low enough to compete with the Amazons of the world. <laughs> And Amazon is, is 
you know, they burn cash every month, despite the creative accounting Bezos uses to present free cash flow, which he admits in the 10K is not a gap number. It's not, it's not an accredited accounting measurement of free cash flow. And when you run through their numbers, you can see they burn cash every quarter. But it's because he doesn't have a, a, a debt load. He is not obligated to make fixed coupon payments every every six months to bondholders. And and that's all these brick and mortar retail operations. Sears is going to hit the wall as well. I mean, they have an incredible amount of debt. Yep. They're they're crashing. It's just a matter of time. Speak. Right. So and that's so that's what the problem is. It's it's not online versus brick and mortar. I mean, Amazon now has the, the <laughs> as the gall to say that, oh, well, we're going to roll out some brick and mortar stores as well. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> doesn't that kind of invalidate this idea that online is better than brick and mortar? I mean, quite frankly, when I try on clothing, I want to go try it on and right. decide right there if it's going to fit. I don't want to have to. I've had to send things back that don't fit via online and it's a pain in the butt. Yeah, it's no fun. Yeah, there are certain things that you just, you know. You got to get personal with, and you can't get personal online. It's just that simple. I think that the uh, retail apocalypse is, uh, it'll be. It really should be called the debt apocalypse, not yes. the retail apocalypse. That's, you're you're absolutely right. I mean, what part of the uh, uh, corporate stock buyback is that? That's I would think that that's playing a fairly significant role in companies like H.H. H. Gregg and Sears and Macy's having all these problems because you can only cannibalize so much of your company before there is, there's nothing left to, to, to buy. Yeah. To, I don't, to, I don't to drive know. their valuations higher. I don't know if companies like H.H. H. Gregg are issuing debt to buy back their stock per se. I think, I think they're, I don't know. I, I know the bigger companies. That's that's what's fueling the stock market, or had been, was the corporate debt buybacks. Yes. I mean, uh, issuing debt to buy back stock. I mean, you look at companies like Apple and and uh, Facebook, and Microsoft, and IBM. I mean, they're issuing debt, and then they're going and buying shares. They're not investing in their business. Right. And seeing, I would I would presume that these, you know, non fang companies are doing the same thing. I don't know. I haven't. I haven't looked at enough financial statements. You know, I can't look at them all. But um, I think these companies just issue debt because it's a cheap form of capital. Whether they use it to buy back shares or or overbuild their store base, which is what happens. That I think that's what's going on more likely in retail is is the debts being used to over over expand. Mm -hmm. They expand beyond their markets, and and then it, that's what cannibalizes their sales. Gotcha. That makes sense too. And then they're in a position where they can't f compete with the online model because they, they can't lower their prices that enables them to compete because they got debt commitments. And that, right. that's where these companies hit the wall. That makes sense. Well, I guess that's as uh, good a place as any to wrap it up, don't you think, Dave? Yeah, that sounds good to me. All right, dude. Well, y'all have a good afternoon, and uh, I guess we'll pick it up on Thursday and see where we stand. That sounds good. Have a good one. You too, buddy.